everyone and welcome. This is the fifth webinar in a series of five, so my maths being my maths, it's the fifth and the last. And today what we're doing is looking at good habits with regard to co-ownership. Once again, this webinar is presented to you on behalf of Stuart Title, and I'm delighted to say that Stuart Title, Stephen and Robert and their team have been supportive of the profession for a number of years now and have been willing to sponsor these webinars. And of course, I'm grateful to them for their support to me and of course, the support to the legal profession generally. As far as questions are concerned, of course, this is recorded. I am happy, however, to deal with any questions or queries that you've got via email. Stuart Tide will have my email details and the email address is shown on the last slide. And significantly and importantly, if you have any requests relating to title indemnity insurance or any questions relating to Stuart Title products, then please contact Stuart Title. And again, their contact details are shown on the last slide. So 10 good habits in co-ownership. An apology, there's more than 10 good habits that I'm going to be bleating about today, but there are 10 significant points that I want to get over. Co-ownership causes problems in residential conveyancing for a number of reasons. And we're going to share and explore some of those reasons. We're going to look at good practice and of course we're going to come up with some good habits. So why is co-ownership so problematical? Well, a number of reasons. Firstly, clients come to us skipping into our office happy as can be, buying their new home in a sound relationship with partner or sp a spouse. Life is good and they don't want to know about or are not prepared to face potential problems or potential changes in circumstances, significantly the breakdown of that relationship and what happens next. So I think that's a major part that the clients come in happy as can be, thinking that everything is rosy, not contemplating what happens if this relationship goes wrong, not happening a number of, not, not interpreting or predicting a number of sort of doomsday scenarios. Uh, that, uh, can throw, that life can throw up for us and can create difficulties. So that's a problem. I think conveyances making assumptions is another problem. And again, I think the reason that conveyances make assumptions is they're not getting paid enough to think about alternatives or to spend time with clients to digest what the client's position is to ensure that appropriate advice is being given. If we work on the basis of a fixed fee, given the problems and vagaries of the conveyancing process, we don't really have the time, we can't afford the time to engage with a client to sort of deal with what are perhaps some sort of pretty deep uh, social, pretty deep sort of moral issues that co-ownership can throw up. For example, the fact that the parties have been in previous relationships, there are children, perhaps children that are under the age of 18, grown up children and what are their wishes, and what are, what are their plans and what do we want to do as clients with regard to seeing the best for them with regard to our dying at some point in the future. So insufficient time, insufficient fees, I think, is an issue. Uh, inadequate recording of clients' intentions. So drilling down to the client, what do you really want here? What, we, what are we being asked to do? That's important. And then recording what those intentions are. So we've got to record what our clients are telling us. And we've also got to record what our advice is as a consequence of what we've been told. And there, there are opportunities for all sorts of problems, failing to record, inaccurately recording, or not providing sufficient detail with regard to recording their issues. A failure to explain choices. So again, you know, there are a number of choices with regard to co-ownership. Do you really need to own as co-owners? Would it not be more beneficial for the property to be placed in the sole name of one party as opposed to the other. That might be a perfectly reasonable suggestion in the circumstances. And a failure to advise once a choice has been made by clients. And remember, it is client's choice. So, all right, it's easy for us to say, you own a current property as joint tenants, your husband and wife in a stable relationship, you're buying a property and there are equal contributions relating to that property, therefore, we assume a joint tenancy would be appropriate. So easy to fall into that trap better to explain the choices that the clients have available to them no matter what their current circumstances and then to listen to what the clients have to say about the choices that are available 
and then give advice and steer the client as to what would be appropriate. So clearly, where you've got unequal contributions, you've got a relatively new relationship with parties bringing into this relationship assets and both having children of varying ages, etc., then of course a tenancy in common may be appropriate, but the clients may be insist may be insistent on a joint tenancy. So advising clients about the potential dangers associated with what you're being instructed to do is important. And recording advice. Again, not blaming conveyances or solicitors at all. What I am saying is the pressures of conveyancing, time constraints, volume of work, working from home, etc., means that often it's difficult to record detailed advice or detailed instruction. And as I'm going to show you in a moment or two, a failure to do that can have significant implications and an ability to do that can solve a lot of problems going forward. Co-ownership causes negligence claims. It also causes client complaints because when the happy couple that comes skipping into your office three years later are at war with one another and one of them realizes that the advice that they received or the advice that wasn't given has led to them losing out with regard to the share of the proceeds of sale or the spoils of the relationship, if I can call them that, will mean that the client will be willing to point the finger. When I first started dealing with conveyancing transactions, clients would often, if an error occurred or something went wrong in a conveyancing transaction, just basically hold their hands up and say, well, you know, these things happen. These days, the client's attitude, because we're far more litigious, is, well, no, these things don't just happen. These things happen because you failed to do something or you did something that you ought not to have done. And therefore, we've got to be protective and indeed defensive with regard to the conveyancing process, generally co-ownership in particular. There are three good habits that I think are significant from the outset with regard to co-ownership. One, there's no such thing as a collective client. If we're dealing with husband and wife, people in a civil partnership, people in a long-term relationship, we are not acting for the relationship, we're not acting for the married couple, we're not acting for the partnership. We are acting for individuals. Therefore, <clears throat> those individuals must give us common instruction. They must be singing from the same hymn sheet. And where there is divergence with regard to instruction or divergence with regard to understanding, we've got to be careful. So just as I've said about having conversations with clients, making sure they understand, where we have a situation where both clients are attending a virtual meeting or attending at our office, then that's fine. We can gauge the client's level of understanding, their issues, their objectives with regard to the transaction fairly easily. Where that isn't the case or where there is some form of divergence with regard to instructions, talking to clients individually, in my view, is critical and something that should be addressed and dealt with in the appropriate circumstances. Next good habit, identifying financial contribution. I want my clients to tell me what they are paying into with regard to this purchase. Who's going to be paying mortgage? Who's going to be the major breadwinner? Who's paying the majority of the deposit? What assets are we bringing in? Which properties are we selling? And who has contributed towards the purchase of those assets or those properties? We need the big picture with regard to financial contributions, and we need to identify clients' intentions. In connection with financial contributions and clients' intentions, the obvious thing here is the use of a co-ownership questionnaire. The majority of firms use them. Every firm should have one. Clients should complete them. They should be as detailed as possible. The document should be signed by the clients as a record that the, what the client is telling you is true, and for the client to understand the seriousness of the information that's being transmitted to you. I would also suggest that the form is uh, dated as well. Some firms will send an individual co-ownership questionnaire to each client and ask them to complete it. I don't think that's necessary, but I do think that where a form has been completed, if it's signed by both, we need to check signatures and just be aware of the fact that one party might have uh, intercepted the post, completed the form, 
and forged a signature. Where there's any doubt of that, I'd be telephoning the collective clients individually and asking them that they understand and appreciate what that form reveals. Identifying client intention, short term, medium, and long term, is important, not just the current position. So, what is the position with regard to uh, any likely inheritance, any likely um, increase in income, any promotions, or anything of that nature that could mean there is a divergence with regard to contributions going forward relating to the property? Making sure clients understand that what we're doing is giving advice relevant to the current situation. Circumstances may change, in which case further advice might be appropriate. So we might be thinking about severing a joint tenancy, or we might think about terminating a tenancy in common and converting it into a joint tenancy at some point in the future. If that is the case, clients need to be aware of the fact that uh, instruction needs to be given to conveyance or solicitor and uh, work undertaken to, in order to remedy the position and to correct the uh, conversion process or to deal with the conversion process. I've given you the case of Turner against Bromwich Jackson Heath, which is a 2016 decision. And normally, when I'm showing you case law, it's always because a uh, lawyer's got it wrong. But here I'm delighted to say lawyers got it right. Claim was brought by an aggrieved co owner who alleged that there had been a failure to explain obligations and duties owed by a declaration of trust. There was also an argument put forward that because there were unequal contributions being made by the parties, there was naturally a conflict of interest as between their interests. The court had a long, hard look at this, had a long, hard look at the conduct of the conveyancer involved and considered the file. And they determined a number of points. Firstly, there had been a full explanation of the proposed declaration of trust. And not only had there been an explanation, but there'd been evidence that that explanation had been effectively communicated and that the client understood what she'd been told and was fully aware of her position. The court also emphasized that just because there are unequal contributions, that doesn't automatically lead to a conflict of interest. It potentially generates a risk of a conflict of interest, but doesn't automatically create one. So what's the good habit that we extract from this case? Well, keeping records of advice and conversation, making sure that we're recording that what we've told our client has been received by the client and understood. Those sort of magic two words, there's been effective communication really is the key. So an interesting case, when you look at the facts, as I say, um, the claimant um, made a number of arguments that were proved to be ineffective because the conveyancing file was meticulous with regard to records and recording important features of discussions, explanation and conversations. So, you know, a, a great sort of uh, beacon, as it were, as to good practice management in connection with the co-ownership content. I then mentioned the case of Oxley and Hiscock, which again highlights three good habits. Making sure that we inquire about sources of funds, not just cash, but asset that is being sold in order to fund the purchase. We need to do that anywhere. Making sure that we inquire about the responsibility for discharging mortgage payments and making sure that we've got enough information on our file to be able to give appropriate advice. Again, making sure that questionnaires are utilized that complete the picture right at the start of the transaction to enable us to assimilate client circumstances and give advice to then receive instruction and then determine whether what we've been told about circumstances is consistent with what instructions are and being very careful to make sure that where instructions received are inconsistent with information received that we protect ourselves and indeed protect our clients by warning them of the dangers of proceeding on the basis that their instructions propose.
So, so far we've talked about generality relating to advice. And in the context of co-ownership, it isn't enough simply to provide information relating to choice and explanation relating to choice. It is necessary to give advice as to whether or not what the clients are proposing is supported by the information and data that the client has given you and makes sense legally. So where clients are happy to proceed on the basis of a joint tenancy in law and in equity, it is important to explain to the client the doctrine of survivorship, the significance of survivorship, and the availability of severance. And the key point here is, when we talk about severance, severance can be a unilateral act. So it matters not that um, we have agreed a joint tenancy if my fellow co-owner decides that they wish a tenancy in common to replace the joint tenancy, I have no say as to whether or not the joint tenancy is severed and a tenancy in common created. It happens automatically. The only saving grace for me is that a equitable joint tenancy is created, therefore the 50-50 division of asset remains, although in a slightly different context. With regard to tenancies in common, important to understand again what happens on death with regard to the beneficial interest and again where we're choosing a tenancy in common on the basis of unequal contributions to explain to clients how we reach the proportion of contribution that each is is deemed to have and thus apportioning the beneficial interest to meet contribution or where that isn't the case, where we're saying we're holding the tenancy in common on an 80-20 split, but the reality is the split is 60-40. The, the client's understanding that where we are reducing that agreement into our transfer or into a declaration of trust, the fact that it isn't truly representative of what the actual contributions are is of no consequence on the basis that the court will always give effect to the documents. Only if there is a significant imbalance as between the parties or significant factors that would warrant a court looking behind the declaration of trust or indeed the transfer is the court prepared to do so. So if we've got an 80-20 contribution but the parties agreeing and allowing a deed of trust to be created on a 60-40 split, it's going to be difficult if not impossible for the party that's made the 80% contribution to argue that they're entitled to an 80% uh, payment with regard to the beneficial interest in the event of their relationship um, evaporating and the property being sold. Beneficial interest should always mirror the actual contributions of the parties. Where they don't, the clients must be warned the fact that we've drafted a document, they've signed documents that basically the courts are going to utilise in determining distribution of proceeds of sale where property is sold. So the good habit, as I mentioned at the bottom of this slide, assume nothing, explain choices, and be particularly careful where there's inconsistency between fact and how the client wants beneficial interest to be held. There are some practical problems with regard to co-ownership. The time that needs to be taken to explain the differences between a joint tenancy and a tenancy in common. Now, there used to be a land registry public guide 18. Today, I had a look on the government website because historically I, was, I thought that all the information in land registry public 18 was now available on the government website. When I have a look at the government website, as I did today, the amount of information with regard to choice and the law relating to joint tenancies and tenancy in common is rather sparse. And therefore, it is important that in your standard emails, letters of advice, reports on title to clients, you explain in layman's terms the implication of a joint tenancy. 50-50 split, equal division, no um, division of the property. You own, all, you own half of all the property not half of bits, to explain the fact that a joint tenancy is capable of being severed, as I've mentioned, 
to explain to the client the doctrine of survivorship, what happens on the death of one joint tenant, what happens on the death of both, typically significant if you have sort of common accidents on the basis that the younger is deemed to have survived the older and the significance of that with regard to what happens to the property. Again, important where both parties have children from previous relationships. You know, is that fair? Is that equitable? Is that what the client wants? Where there is a joint tenancy or indeed a tenancy in common, what happens if one party wishes to sell? So a brief explanation as to the uh, workings of Talata and Section 14 and uh, orders for sale and Section 15 factors utilised by the court to determine sale. The implications of a tenancy in common, the position with regard to the death of a tenant in common, the need for a will and the need for a deed of trust. What happens if one tenant in common wants to sell? So these factors need to be explained. I'm doing a lot of work at the moment for a number of organisations about how we report on title. And the problem that I have is that in one breath, I'm telling you we need to clarify and transmit all this information to clients. But in another breath, I'm saying, hey, you know, the idea of sending an 80, 90 page report on title to a client isn't particularly effective by way of communication. You know, we're sending or over, uh, too much information to clients and overloading them. So what do I, what would I suggest in those circumstances? How do I address the um, dichotomy of sort of advice that I'm giving? Well, what I suggest is as follows. Instead of providing a client with an 80 or 90 page report on title, I would deal with co-ownership as a sort of separate issue and uh, simply incorporate what my findings are and what ultimately we've agreed in the report under a short couple of paragraphs. But I would have an explanation to the client about all of these practical problems in an email or some form of communication to the client about the choices that are available to them about the law relating to those choices. As far as clients are concerned, they've got to be aware of choice. They've got to understand the documentation that we're drafting and the significance of it. So when we are uh, drafting a transfer, a TR1, the clients need to understand that in that TR1 we'll be stating how the legal estate and beneficial interest is held, that where they're signing that transfer, they're in effect giving effect to what has been agreed, and the clients need to understand if circumstances change, what can be done to ensure that that change is recorded legally and thus enforceable. Clients need to be aware of what happens where relationship breaks down, in other words, that it is possible because a trust has been created that an order for sale relating to the property can be achieved, courtesy of Talata, as I mentioned a little earlier, and also that clients need to understand and appreciate that before we get to the position of a sale of the property, that there are things that can be done with regard to a tenancy in common or a joint tenancy in order to ensure that the process of, uh, of achieving a sale achieves a desired result for the party seeking so. So I think the important point here is that we need to think about the present situation and the future and explain to the client the doomsday, situa doomsday situation of the relationship failing and the need for the property to be sold and what the creation of a trust does and what holding the property as a joint tenant or holding the property as a tenancy in common does when that relationship breaks down. To that end, the issue of severing a joint tenancy needs to be explained to clients. The method of severance and the fact that the method of severance can be a unilateral act, the giving of notice, the dealing with one share, etc. But in essence, what the process will ultimately lead to is a lodging of form SEV at the land registry or the submission of a form RX1. The land registry specify what documentation is required relating to allowing the severance of a joint tenancy 
and the imposition of a uh, restriction on the title indicates indicating a tenancy in common has been created as far as severing the joint tenancy is concerned one of the things the land registry are interested in is the giving of notice to the other joint tenants so it is important not only to explain severance but also to explain the practicalities of how a joint tenant severs and the significance of severance i have to say in all my experience practitioners are very good at telling clients about severance but what i have seen are a number of gaps with regard to advice to clients concerning actually how they sever and the significance of severance to that end there are some important cases uh, singler and brown and malden brown is interesting in that um, the uh, notice of severance in this particular case uh, specified how the beneficial interest was to be held upon severance and indicated that it wasn't to be held on a 50-50 basis. So the person severing said, from now on, I own a greater beneficial interest than you do. And because the notice of severance was receipted by the fellow joint tenant, the court held that the joint tenancy was severed and the beneficial interest was not held on the basis of a 50-50 split, but was held in the proportion that the parties had agreed by one party saying in the notice, this is how it's going to be held, and by the other party acknowledging receipt and not challenging that standpoint. Boycott and Williams, a 2011 High Court decision, is interesting because this is the case that first um, warned me that practitioners might be getting things wrong with regard to explaining methods of severance. Because in this case, you had a property owner that put the property into joint names when it wasn't necessary to do so. Um, people um, getting together, relatively elderly couple getting together, one, Mr. Boycott, quite a wealthy chap, uh, deciding for whatever reason, to put the property in the joint names of him and his then partner, not being told that a joint tenancy was created um, that could be severed, assuming from the facts that as the his partner was older than he was, that if all things ran their normal course, she would die before him, and therefore he would get his property back, not realizing that she could at any stage after the joint tenancy was created, sever it, which is what she did, not immediately, but when the relationship began to break down. So we can extract from that case law that clients need to have drilled into them where a joint tenancy is created, that a joint tenancy can be unilaterally severed. Again, Clients are told about severance, they're not told that it can be a unilateral act, and they're not told about the significance of severance, that we have an automatic tenancy in common created, meaning that survivorship no longer applies. With regard to tenancies in common, clients need to be told that there is no doctrine of survivorship, and therefore it's essential that the clients have wills, or if they don't, they understand the implications of intent intestacy that they need to understand and appreciate that where a tenancy in common is created, the tenancy in common should stipulate how the beneficial interest is held. Where there isn't such a stipulation, remember what the courts say, the courts will look at contribution and the beneficial interest will be held in proportion to that contribution. Where the declaration of trust is in a document, the courts will give effect to that document whether the document accurately records how the beneficial interest is held or otherwise being an irrelevance. Is the deed of trust required? Well, I maintain yes it is, because a deed of trust will specify how the beneficial interest is divided, will also manage and regulate the trust. The alternative is Land Registry Form JO, and Land Registry Form JO is useful in providing evidence as to how the beneficial interest is held, but fairly useless with regard to trust control and management. So a deed of trust is needed. If a deed of trust is prepared, and normally it will be prepared by your private client team, 
then the client needs to be advised of the need to keep that deed of trust under review. A good habit with regard to recording joint tenancies and tenancies in common is to make sure that the transfer is drafted such that the nature of the co-ownership is properly recorded and where a tenancy in common is required, the transfer should recite the division of the beneficial interest. And of course, it follows from that, that the transfer must be signed. In the notes, I've mentioned a number of cases where transfers have not been signed and the case law is unclear as to what the legal position is. But all I can tell you is that the legal position is confusing and it would seem to me that given that we've got conflicting case law going either side of the argument, that the only real way of testing the matter would be to litigate it with all the costs and worries associated with it. Can we convert a tenancy in common into a joint tenancy? Well, the answer is yes, we can. However, important point, we can only do so with the cooperation of our fellow tenants in common. So just as a, a joint tenancy can be severed unilaterally, where we are advised to proceed on the basis of a tenancy in common, clients need to be aware that if circumstances change and a joint tenancy is suitable or chosen by one of the tenants in common, we've got to ensure that our colleague tenants in common go along with us in order for the conversion to take place. We need to lodge form RX3 at the land registry to remove the Form A restriction. And to do that, the land registry would want to see a copy of a new or updated trustee signed by the, all the owners or a certificate from a conveyancer confirming that the new trustee has been uh, prepared. My view is that uh, the land registry would want to see the document rather than relying on a conveyancer confirming that a document exists. There is also a requirement for a certified copy of a transfer showing that all owners with individual shares of the property have transferred these to all as beneficial joint tenants. And the land registry would require a statement in Form 5. If you look at the relevant practice guide, the detail required in Form 5 is stipulated. No one else except the named joint owners have shares in the property. None of the joint owners is made bankrupt, has a charging order from creditors or is mortgaging their share and all the joint owners now own the property as beneficial joint tenants. So there's a little bit of work there, a little bit, quite a bit of work to be done, but it is possible to convert, but clients need to be aware that we all need to be singing from the same hymn sheet where we as tenants in common wish to convert into a joint tenancy. So I think we explained to the clients that there is a possibility of creating a joint tenancy, but the consent is required from all involved. I mentioned this issue about what happens if a TR1 isn't signed. And the first point, just for general conveyancing practice, is that TR1s do not have to be signed by a buyer in order to be a valid transfer of the land. As long as the seller signs it, that's fine. Buyers should only be required to sign it where a buyer is giving the seller an indemnity covenant, or, in my view, the transfer should always be signed when the buyers are co-owners because the transfer will record how the legal estate and beneficial interest is to be held if properly completed. In Taylor and Taylor and the case of Dowie, both in 2017, what we had were errors made and the TR1 was not properly completed. And in those circumstances, each case was decided differently. But there were arguments that the sellers were holding the property on trust for the buyers. And as far as that trust was concerned, the trust in one case was that they were holding as tenants in common, and in the other circumstance, they were holding as joint tenants. Basically, the differential between the cases was that there was evidence of intention as to how the beneficial interest was to be held in both cases. One, persuading the court to say that this was, in essence, a joint tenancy, and then the other one saying this was, in essence, a tenancy in common, but relying upon independent evidence as to what the buyers intended was to happen to the beneficial interest. An entirely unsatisfactory situation, 
that can only be tested by a hearing of the court with all the costs associated. Some conclusions relating to co-ownership that we need to explore and examine. Firstly, the use of co-ownership questionnaires. The vast majority of firms that I speak with or present to have their own form of co-ownership questionnaires, and I'm delighted about that, because it means that you have evidence on your file as to what is intended from the parties, what they wish the beneficial interest to be uh, dealing with, and what their actual contributions are. The questionnaire should stipulate whether assets are being sold to fund the purchase, and if so, who owns those assets and what are they worth? What direct financial contributions are being made towards the purchase? And what future liabilities are being met by the parties and how that future liability is being paid for? So if we've got that and we've got the client stipulating, hey, we understand the position and we want to own as joint tenants, then that's good. The important point about that is this issue of informed consent. If we're sending a questionnaire out to the client and asking the client to tell us about their financial contributions and what they want with regard to beneficial interests, it presupposes that they understand the choices that they have available to them. And therefore, the way that, that this would work from a time scale, I think, is that we provide our client with the information relating to choices and explain to our client the significance of those choices. Then the client fills the questionnaire in, giving details of actual contribution and what their wishes are with regard to the beneficial interest. In doing that, the client should understand or appreciate what they're suggesting with regard to their choice of co-ownership. Then I think what we do is we scrutinize what the client has said in the questionnaire and then advise the client as to the significance of their choice and advise the client whether what they're suggesting appears reasonable given the circumstances. Where what they're proposing appears reasonable, I think we provide an email or letter to the client explaining why and suggesting that they revisit their instructions. Where a client is hell-bent on proceeding as per their intent, despite your instructions that what is being suggested is unwise, I think a further email and a requirement that the client signs a letter or acknowledges receipt of the email and confirms they understand the warning you're giving is appropriate. Where you're having discussions with the client about choice, about advice, about what they wish, those, would, those discussions I would record carefully. And I would not be averse to sending the client a copy of the attendance note, asking them to confirm it's a true record, where they're insistent on doing something that's contrary to common sense and contrary to my advice. I think it's important that we listen to clients and hear what they've got to say about their choices. And as I say, when we talk about effective communication, explaining, transmitting information to the client, but also sitting back and listening to what they've got to say, and listening to the clients as individuals, not listening to collective instruction. Certainly we should be giving advice, and certainly we shouldn't be assuming anything at all. Upon conclusion of our purchase, I think we should be writing to our client. And as I mentioned to practitioners on a number of occasions before, the final letter to the client should deal with a number of things. One, it should advise clients about the need to keep addresses for service up to date. Two, where our client has decided to purchase on the basis of a joint tenancy or a tenancy in common, a need that our client keeps that decision relating to beneficial interest under review, and in particular where a tenancy in common has been created and a deed of trust created 
advising clients that where there are changes with regard to the extent or scope of beneficial interest, that deed of trust requires attention and varying. Of course, the other thing that I mentioned when, um, upon concluding instructions, keeping addresses for service up to date and uh, very relevant given that to today's presentation is part of a series on behalf of Stuart Title where defective title insurance policies have been taken out, advising clients of the need to ensure that they are aware that their obligations to the insurer continue despite the fact that we are now removing ourselves from the picture and closing our file. Co-ownership, I repeat, causes negligence claims because the party that came skipping into your office three years later when the house is sold and realizes that their spouse or partner on divorce or on separation is getting 80% of the proceeds of sale and they're only getting 20 will be aggrieved. That grief can be exacerbated where property prices increase, equity increases. So on acquisition, you know, 80% of £20,000 is not that much money. But 80% of £200,000 or so, or, or, uh, when that property is sold, all of a sudden becomes a life changing amount, enabling that party to buy a house outright, where the other, with a 20% 20 stake, perhaps nothing more than a deposit on a new property. That's when the grief, finger pointing, and uh, complaints or potential claims can arise. And therefore, be alive to it, make sure clients are aware of what can happen in the future and protect yourselves. It also leads to complaints. Clients, well, you, know, you didn't tell me about this. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't understand the significance of severance or of a uh, tenancy in common. I didn't get what we were doing there. Okay, again, as we saw in that case of Turner that I mentioned earlier in my presentation, our file is going to be our defence and our shield with regard to complaints or claims. On behalf of Stuart Title and myself, Ian Quayle and IQ Legal Training, thank you very much indeed for attending today. We've looked at lots of issues, tenancies in common, joint tenancies, and practice and procedure relating to both. Your point of contact with regard to anything concerning title indemnity insurance is Robert Kelly, the business development manager for Stuart Title, who is always available to deal with questions and issues. There is a vast team at Stuart Title that are able to take uh, emails, inquiries, etc., and to assist with regard to standard policies and bespoke policies. And again, they're so ready and available details on Stuart Title's website. If there are any questions, queries, or anything arising from this presentation, if you don't have a co-ownership questionnaire and you'd like to see one, do drop me a note via my email address. I'll endeavour to assist or contact Robert or indeed anyone at Stuart Title and they will contact me. But finally, on behalf of Stuart Title and myself, thank you very much indeed for listening and good day.